as the ancestral unceded homelands of the Atacapa Isha, Karankawa, Mariame, Akokisa, Carizo Kome Crudo, Tonkawa, Kawawila Tukan, as well as the Alabama Cushada, the Kickapoo, the Islita del Sur Pueblo, the Lipan Apache, and the Texas Band of Yaqui Indian Tribes. We honor their elders past and present, as well as the indigenous people from many nations who live and work in this region today. May this acknowledgement be a humble first step in the undoing of indigenous erasure, providing accurate historical context while serving as a reminder to current non-native inhabitants as we strive towards peace, reconciliation, and justice. Thank you, Sakis. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a land acknowledgement that we wanted to do before we start the program. And uh, we wanted to welcome you all tonight for coming out on this really important topic. Uh, our Building Safer Communities Town Hall on Gun Violence Prevention is something we've been talking about for a long time. And the reason we wanted to do it was because we know that Asian Americans are really affected by gun violence. And yet we haven't really had an opportunity to discuss what that means for us as an Asian community, what it is we can do about it, and what is our strategy moving forward to make sure that it doesn't become an even bigger issue in our community. Um, so we have a really wonderful uh, panel today assembled to talk about exactly that issue. Um, so, uh, but before we begin, I did want to invite someone from Commissioner Leslie Bionis' office, uh, my good friend Ruthie Natarajan, and she has a proclamation regarding gun violence. Thank you, Nabila. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, I am with Commissioner Leslie Briones, and she sends everyone her best regards, and she's sorry that she can't be here, but here's what she has to say. She recognizes Rice AAPI on the occasion of the Building Safer Communities Town Hall, which is happening right now, as Precinct 4 Commissioner of Harris County and on behalf of the constituents of Harris County, it is her privilege to recognize RISE AAPI on the special occasion of the Building Safer Communities Town Hall on Gun Violence Prevention. It is her honor to recognize everyone attending this meaningful and valuable event. She's very grateful to RISE AAPI for their leadership and commitment to the safety of the community. And she commends everyone for continuing to elevate the voices of the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities and looks forward to the positive impact that RISE AAPI's great work will do throughout Harris County. Signed, Leslie Briones. Thank you so much, Ruthie. Um, and and I, just as a reminder, uh, Rise kind of took the lead on this, but we are doing this with uh, a bunch of really valuable and great organizations. Um, some of them are right here. We have them here on our uh, little slide here. Um, Indian American Impact, MDH Action, DIA, Emerging Voters, UCA, and TMAC, which is a newly formed organization called the Texas Multicultural Advocacy Coalition. And so we're very proud to work with them and appreciate the support of our uh, elected officials as we, we do this work. Um, so gun violence affects all of us in many different ways. And a lot of times it affects our young, uh, young people. And they really bear the brunt of the anxiety and, and the issues uh, that come with, with having a society that's steeped so much in gun violence. And, um, and we're very lucky to have with us a young man, his name is Milan Narayan. He is actually a school shooting survivor and he's um, talked about his experience living through that um, many times and, and we're very um, honored and, and grateful for him to, to be able to share his story with us tonight. We thought that would be the best way to start this program off, um, off and see what it really means to live through 
gun violence, um, especially what it means to our young people and how it affects them. So I'm gonna invite uh, Milan to come up here on stage, please. Thank you. So I wanted to start this out by you know, telling my story and telling the story of the other students that were at Bellar High School um, on, on January 14, 2020. So January 14, 2020 was just another day at Bellar High School. I was in 10th grade, my friends were talking about um, this little history essay that they had to do. I didn't have to do it, I did it online. Um, and I, I had baseball practice, it was, just, it was just a normal day. It was a chilly Houston day though, 75 degrees. <laughs> but anyway, so baseball practice was outside, and I remember final bell finally rang, and, and everybody was heading home, and I packed up my things to head home as well. What happened in the following minutes would permanently change the nature of Beller High School and its 3,800 students and faculty. 19-year-old Cesar Cortez was fatally shot and killed in a classroom no more than a few hundred feet away from where I was, at, where I was standing at my baseball practice. The commotion was disturbing and horrifying, Thousands of students were escorted and rushed out as fire trucks, police cars, HISD administration, and school administration frantically ran into the building. The uncertainty of the situation heightened everyone's fears, but not one person ever thought for a second that what had happened was that our school had fallen victim to a shooting. The shooting remains the most solemn memory of my high school life. I'd always found this inherent security and, and safety at being at school and being around my peers and my teachers but, but suddenly I felt a new source of discomfort whenever I walked through its doors once again. Everything had changed. The demeanor of the school was somber. Everyone was sad. Officers lined our hallways in the following weeks. We could only enter and exit through one door. It was truly heartbreaking, and I realized that I have still not truly come to terms with the gravity and magnitude of what actually happened that day, nearly four years later. As school shootings continue to make daily news cycles, some of our elected officials have offered some dim-witted and band-aid solutions to the gun violence epidemic in our country. Some students must go to school with clear plastic backpacks so that administration can reduce the risk of a school shooting. You might think this is an issue that we're not dealing with or it's at different schools or different neighborhoods, but it's not. Just ask anyone that went to Lamar High School. We built in and entrenched active shooter drills during instruction time that reinforce the inevitability of gun violence touching a child's life. My high school and many others instituted metal detectors upon entry, and you might think, well, you know, that's not such a bad idea to keep the students safe, but that further highlights the idea that we've become so accustomed to the transformation of schools, formerly institutions of curiosity, education, virtue, and determination into mental and literal prisons. In Texas, teachers can be armed in schools with no training at all if the district deems it necessary. Imagine grappling with the fear that an undertrained faculty member right across from you has a pistol in his or her door. Schools are meant for learning and anticipation, not caution, fear, or distress. I've been involved in gun violence prevention for about five years now, well predating the devastating day at Beller High School, and I was aware of the dangers of gun violence for the youth. I knew that 43 Americans below the age of 19 were shot every day. I knew that over 3,000 youth died every year from gun violence. What I never comprehended was that it was only a matter of time before it affected me. Gun violence may be disproportionate, but it does not discriminate. I live, and you live as well, in an America where gun violence has become so normalized for children and youth that we've become used to all the ridiculous measures and ideas and solutions to protect us. I'm so glad that you all are here because the AAPI community is strikingly underrepresented in these conversations. I hope this is the first of many discussions on community safety revolving around gun violence. I need you all to understand that the importance of the, I need you all to understand the importance of fighting for stronger gun laws. No parent should ever have to send their child to school only for them to never come home. Let's come back to Cesar for a minute. Not only will Cesar's dreams never be realized, but his family has lost so much as well. I've met his mother and his brother. I cannot fathom what they've done. Their lives are irreversibly changed, all because of one firearm. What happened to Cesar has needlessly happened to thousands of other children, and it happens year after year after year, and day after day after day. Gun violence affects so many more than just the victim. We are part of the AAPI community, but we are also part of the American community. This is our problem, too. It's time for our community to play a larger role in pushing for gun violence prevention policies that ensure the safety of everyone. Exactly right. 
right? It, it affects all of us, it affects our young people, it affects our, us, it affects our families, it affects our elders, it affects everyone in our community, and it behooves us to do something about it. Um, one of the, the politicians that has been doing something about it and takes this issue very seriously is um, Congressman Al Green. Uh, he's from District 9, um, taking a leadership role in this role, in this space, and I would invite him to come up and say a few words to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very kind and warm introduction. Would you kindly join me in giving Attorney Monsoon a big expression of appreciation? We know her affectionately as Nabila, and uh, she and I have been working together on a project that I'm sure you'll find more interesting at some later point in time, so I won't share anything about it tonight, but I think it's something that will benefit our community. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Uh, this is a wonderful thing to see this audience. And uh, I can tell you that this is a good-sized audience given the issue that we're dealing with. Normally when I attend events like this, we have maybe 10, 15 people. But uh, this event has exceeded my expectations. I see that we have Rogine Calvert here, uh, which is always a plus. Will you give her a hand for me, please? She's <laughs> I understand that Representative Jean Wu, who represents uh, District uh, 137, will be here at some point. Uh, he is a real fighter, and uh, I may not be here when he arrives, so would you give him a hand for me in his absence, please? <laughs> and Representative Ann Johnson, who represents District 134, uh, I think she's slated to be in attendance. If she's not here already, I don't see her. Would you give her a hand, please? is not here, but I know he's coming as well. Give him a hand too, please. <laughs> uh, he represents District 76. Uh, and uh, Gene Fagelson, I have to mention him because he made my life so much more comfortable. It just made life easy for me when I was a judge. I was a judge for some 25 years, and Gene was a person who worked in the court as a mediator. Did an outstanding job. Uh, Jean, would you just raise your hand, please? Jean, thank you. There are many others here, and I, I dare not try to call every name because then I won't get an opportunity to get to my message. But uh, before getting to my message, the young man that spoke ahead of me, I think he did an outstanding job. An outstanding job. Not only in presentation, but also in the substance that he imparted. I compliment you, sir, and I look forward to seeing you do great things in the future. Uh, when you look at me, you see the present, and when I look at you, I see the future, and the future looks good. Give him another one. <laughs> now, friends, I would like to just take a few moments so that we can get a better understanding as to what the root cause of the root cause is that we're dealing with. Uh, this is something that is has been inculcated into our society, something that, quite candidly speaking, is unusual in the sense that we're dealing with persons who have decided that we will allow unlicensed people to have the level of lethality that, generally speaking, we only find in places where there's a war going on. This level of lethality should not be on our streets. This level of lethality is something that you can acquire in this state without a license, meaning you don't have to be trained to have this level of lethality. Uh, this level of lethality is something that took the lives of 19 babies and uh, two teachers at a school right here in Texas, and the governor of the state of Texas did not do so much as have a special session to just deal with this issue. Uh, this is a this is uh, something that is unusual. You don't expect this kind of thing to occur. Uh, so let's talk about it for just a moment in this sense. Uh, I'd like to share a brief vignette. There is so told the story of a Dr. Faustus, Faustus, uh, he's a German, and uh, he made a bargain with a spirit 
an evil spirit, a Feistian bargain is what it's called. And this bargain was something wherein he wanted power to the extent that he was willing to give up something very personal and valuable to him. Literally, he was willing to give up his soul. Now, this is, a, and I'm speaking to you in a metaphorical sense, but in a metaphorical sense, there has been such a bargain made. And this bargain has been made with the NRA. The NRA makes money when people die. They make money when people die. When people die, gun sales go up. When people die, when those 19 babies die, the NRA made lots of money as a result. We have to recognize who we're dealing with. The people who vote for these bills, this, this legislation, they too are making a false game bargain, but it's not the same as what is going on with the NRA. Because we have literally given the gun manufacturers and the NRA lobby for this, we've given the gun manufacturers immunity from liability. <laughs> literally, they have a privilege that is not known and enjoyed by the overwhelming number of corporate corporations in this country. They are immune from liability. If you sue them because of the legality that they pervade, you will not win because your case won't go to trial. The Congress of the United States of America accorded them this immunity from liability. So you're dealing with, with powers, and now this is just metaphorical sense, but powers that uh, are so strong and so entrenched in this country that what we do tonight has to include the notion that we must register, we must vote, and we have to make hard choices about who will have the opportunity to impact our lives and this lethality. These can be difficult choices for you because you vote for people for many reasons. I submit to you that there probably is no better reason than the lives of our children and the lives of people that are lost on a daily basis because we allow lethality to be in the hands of persons who are non mentis uh, compasses, I believe is the term. Let me check my, my, my notes here just a moment. non compass mentis, meaning they don't have sound judgment. Mm -hmm. These are people who literally should not have a weapon under any circumstances. But in the state of Texas, if you can afford it, you can have it. We have a responsibility to elect people. I'm not making a campaign speech. I'm just telling you the truth. We have a responsibility to elect people who are going to decide that one, you have to have training. The Constitution says you have a right to bear arms, but you have to have some training to have this kind of lethality. Two, we're gonna elect people who are going to decide that we will not allow you to pervade this level of lethality and have immunity from litigation. And the third thing is we have to elect people to office who are going to commit themselves to taking on the local NRA when it decides that it is going to take on people who truly want to make a difference and save lives. This is all about life and death and it's all about those people that you standing, see standing in blue. These officers often are outgunned when they go to the scene of an event that necessitates their presence. They're outgunned. The, the people that they're there to protect will often have weaponry that will have superior firepower to what they will have. It's our duty to protect them. They protect us. We have this responsibility it is in our hands, and I'm gonna beg you to please give strong consideration to the people that you entrust to present the proper legislation to make a difference so that we can overcome this Faustian bargain that has been made with the NRA and with the gun manufacturers. 
They're the people that we ultimately have to get to. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to say these few words. Please note that my, my thoughts are sincere. My means of getting things done, I believe, is about as good as it can be because I do it in the Congress of the United States of America, where I have voted for legislation to eliminate the liability that the gun manufacturers have. I have voted to restrict firearms uh, to children, young people. I have voted to eliminate the gun show loophole that allows persons to buy guns at gun shows that they could, should not be able to buy because of the legality that's being pervaded. So I want you to know that I assure you, I'm going to do all that I can to protect not only your rights, but your lives when I vote in the Congress of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. I know you had um, some place to go, yes, but uh, I think, oh, you have uh, a- Yes, oh. I have something for you. All right, wonderful. Uh, this is a certificate of special congressional recognition that I'd like to present to RISE AAPI for your uh, willingness to take on the challenges of our time to actually read and all of your service to the community on behalf of the constituents of the 9th Congressional District of Texas. I salute your dedicated service to promoting, uh, supporting, and uh, the awareness that you bring to your commitment to end gun violence across the greater Houston area and in so doing across our nation. I'd like to present it at this time to you or the appropriate person to go to someone else. You, you are appropriate? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, shall we take off from <laughs> Really appreciate it. We appreciate all the work you do you. Um, on the national stage to make sure that we are safe. Um, our next panel is really the, I think, one of the most important parts of tonight's evening because it brings real world experts who work in this field day in, day out, and will bring a perspective as to how this affects the Asian American community and what are some things that we can do um, on a practical level to really make a difference and make, uh, make some change in the gun violence prevention space. So um, I'm gonna invite our speakers to come uh, up onto our stage. Um, so first, I'd, I'd like to invite Swati Narayan. She is with TAF, well she's with Daya, and she's with TAF City Partners. You could please come up and give her a round of applause. <laughs> um, and then Dr. May Wynn. Um, she is a board member of Doctors for America, as well as a professor at the Fertitta Family College of Medicine. And our last uh, speaker is Dr. Bindi Nayak Makuria. She is a pediatric surgeon, and um, she is with the UTMB uh, Medical School. All right, so I have bios prepared for all of you, but I think um, what's more important is if we can get into the meat of the discussion and really talk a little bit about why it's so, why gun violence is actually a, a public health issue. And I actually have mics for all of y'all, so I should go to Okay, so, First question. Um, this one is for Swati. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about domestic violence. You work with Daya. I know you guys do a lot of wonderful work with domestic violence survivors. What is the scope of domestic violence in the AAPI community? And how does it intersect with gun violence? First of all, thank you so much, Navila, for having me here. It's good to be here with all of you. I'm sitting here and I've got a cheat sheet and these women over here just can rattle things off off the top of their head. But I, I've got some stats and I wanna make sure that I, um, you know, I don't misrepresent. So I, I'm gonna use my cheat sheet here. Um, so yes, domestic violence is an umbrella term for any form of violence and abuse that happens within a family unit. 
and it, include, it can include intimate partner violence and gender-based violence. So let me kind of give you some numbers um, around what inter, uh, intimate partner violence looks like. In the US, one in three women and one in 10 men experience intimate partner violence. Guns and intimate partner violence, domestic violence are a lethal combination. Every month, an average, an average of 70 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. Nearly half of all women murdered in the United States are killed by a current or former intimate partner, and half of those have been killed by firearms. Women are five times more likely to be murdered by an abusive partner when the abuser has access to a gun. More than, more than one in four homicides in the U.S. are related to domestic violence, and the use, of domestic, the use of firearms in domestic violence situations increases the risk that there will be multiple fatalities. Intimate partner homicide events often result in multiple victims, including the death of coworkers, friends, new dating partners of victims, strangers, police officers, and children or family of a victim. Additionally, it's not uncommon for the perpetrator of intimate partner violence to die by suicide. And even when a weapon is, an, is not discharged, abusers often use the mere presence of a gun to coerce, threaten, or terrorize the victim inflicting enormous psychological damage. One million women alive today, and this is in the US, one million women have reported being shot or shot at by intimate partners, and over 4.5 million women have reported being threatened by a gun by, from an intimate partner. And the risk of violence within our AAPI community may be further exacerbated by the growing presence of firearms. The past few years have indicated an elevated, elevated firearm ownership among, AAPI, among the AAPI community, and concerns regarding violence and firearms among Asians has great, gained greater attention in 2023 due to mass violence incidents involving Asian heritage shooters and their victims. There is a need to disaggregate the data in our communities. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're still kind of looked at as a, a large sort of monolith, but this is what we do know. 16 to 55% of Asian women and up to 68% of Pacific Islander women report experiencing physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Again, these numbers are just in the US. Of 160, 60 homicide cases in Asian families last year, 72% of them were intimate partner homicides or intimate partner homicide suicides, and 78% of them were women and girls. 58% of homicides of AAPI adult women were related to intimate partner violence. Around 650 AAPIs are killed in acts of violence every year. The majority, around 59% of them, are by suicide and 37% are, are homicides. And within our community, Pacific Islanders, South Asians, and Southeast Asians have a higher rate of gun violence than East Asians. Thank you so much, Swati. And actually, anecdotally, I could even tell you that um, through Thea's um, hotline, we have increasingly seen a lot of calls where there are guns in the home. So it, there definitely is um, an increase of firearm ownership among AAPI families. Thank you so much. Um, so that's the domestic violence angle. But we know that um, gun violence is also a public health issue. And um, for that, I wanted to ask Dr. Maywin, I know you have um, a history of working on evidence-based health policy and working on strategies to reduce gun violence. Can you talk to us? Can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between gun violence and public health, and how do we address this issue with approaches that um, look beyond just law enforcement? Yeah, uh, as a family medicine doctor, I like to think that I save lives very slowly because I'm meeting people one on one, and I really love to help people get all the healthcare they need and then the healthcare they don't. So when I'm screening people, 
in the office for wellness visits, their annual physicals, I like to ask, you know, is there a gun in the home? And this is especially important for people of all ages, really, because if you are the parent of a child, you know, it doesn't take very much strength for a kid to pull a trigger and discharge a weapon. So kids are very curious, they like to explore things. It's really important to make sure we talk about storage and safe storage practices with parents. Um, it's also important when it comes to teenagers. So teenagers who might be having some mental health issues, if they find a gun, they're more likely to use that to hurt themselves. And guns are very deadly, so they can be successful. Um, as Swati has talked about, you know, women are often victims of infant partner violence, and that can be a problem. So pregnancy, if you're pregnant, homicide is actually the leading cause of death for people who are pregnant. So that's dangerous. And we think about folks who are maybe watching the news and getting scared and getting fearful, so more AAPIs are buying guns. And then especially as people age, so you have older adults, like grandparents who might have a gun in the home and they want to hold on to that so that they can help protect themselves. But the research that we have shows that when you have a gun in the home, you're more likely to get hurt by it than someone else. So this problem is so widespread and it touches among all sorts of different populations and ages and ethnic groups that it's really important that we talk about this with everybody and let folks know what you can do to stay safe. And one of the things that I'm I, you know, Moms Demand Action has a fantastic Be Smart program that they're in the back that you can find out more um, about ways that you can, you know, stay safe and, and store things safely so that you can try to help keep weapons out of, you know, little kids' hands. Um, there are so many different policies that we could try to promote, and I thank the Congress folks and elected officials who've been trying to fight and do this. Um, I don't think that the loosening of gun restrictions the legislature has passed in the past two years has done anything to make us safer. And if anything, it just makes guns more available and easier for anybody to get. And that means there are more guns in the, among the public and that's just more dangerous. I mean, how many people here drive? <laughs> okay, I would be very scared about being a victim of like road rage and like getting shot, like anywhere. Um, that's dangerous, right? Um, Milana has been in school in a very nice school, in a nice neighborhood, and there's been a shooting there. Like, do you, does anyone have kids in school? And the fact that the legislature now allows teachers to have guns in the classroom, that just blows my mind, because I'm sure teachers are very busy teaching students, and they don't have time or training to like go and learn how to use a weapon safely and carry it around. Where are you gonna store that in the classroom? Like, that's just outrageous. Um, I don't, there, there are just so many different things that we can do. I mean, number one, I think, would be to have, make sure that there are actually strong background checks for everyone who wants to buy a gun. If, if you're giving the gun to someone in your family as a gift, I think that person should also undergo a background check. I mean, just having that kind of fingerprint, licensing, making sure we are trying to keep people who have a history of violence or a history of being dangerous or having mental health issues, like making sure that they don't have access to such a dangerous weapon. Um, I mean, we have a surgeon here next to me who can talk about how dangerous these are and just the effects that you can see when people are shot. And it is, it's just so disturbing that we're seeing injuries like that here in a city, in America, you know, like, in the news in the past week, there was like a multiple stabbings, like in South Korea, like some some young men who were just feeling really angry and isolated when he stabbed a bunch of people. Most of the people survived. You can't do as much damage with a knife. But here, we have access to guns, and we're the only country in the world that has a number of mass shootings that we have. Um, mass shootings get a lot of attention, but you know, homicides are also an issue, injuries are an issue. But there are a lot of different ways that we can try to tackle it. The, First thing I would start with would be background checks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. Um, and, and really the same question to you, uh, Dr. Nagi Kuria. Uh, I know you work with the Houston's mayor office and the leadership on leadership on gun violence prevention. You're a pediatric surgeon. You see this every day. Um, can you talk, us, tell, talk to us a little bit about that relationship between public health and gun violence? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so public health is a problem that affects a lot of people in the public, right? So you may, you may or may not know that gun violence is now the leading cause of death in children. Leading cause, more than cancer, more than heart disease, more than car crashes, anything. It's the leading cause of death. So, you know, if that doesn't prove that that's a public health problem, I don't know what it does. In adults, it's not the leading cause, but it's up there. It's probably like the top three. Um, but it's continuing to rise. It's, you know, that's why a lot of people call it an epidemic, because it's continuing to rise. Uh, we, look, my team and I, my research team and I, collected the data from all the um, injuries and deaths. You hear a lot about the deaths. There's a lot of injuries. Three or four times as many people get shot and injured by a gun and don't die. But that's still really important. A lot of them have long-term disability, not to mention the psychological trauma. A lot of them lose their jobs. Um, and then it, there, you know, there's a ripple effect of people, their families being affected. Um, survivors of gun violence are more prone to suicide, depression, um, or even causing violence themselves. So the ripple effect is huge. And this is um, just becoming really prevalent. So between so in, the, in the research we looked at just here in Houston, between 2018 and 2020, the number of um, shootings doubled. And, and in children, for example, we found there was about um, 500 injuries and deaths, and in adults, 5,000 injuries and deaths. When we looked at the data from all the police departments of um, any calls, you know, calls um, with firearms, there was about 10,000 in that period. And um, our city is, you know, you, you, you know, in the 90s, it used to the, the, the levels used to be the highest. They're not quite there yet. But I think the difference is, is that it's not just clustered in those, you know, bad neighborhoods anymore. It's now everywhere. Everyone knows someone, or is two or three degrees away from someone who has been shot or injured. Um, and it's, you know, it's just with the mass shootings, it's something that could now happen to anyone, no matter where they come from, what they look like, how much money they make, you know, and whether or not they have a gun. And so it's just so prevalent. I um, take care of gun violence victims all the time. It's really, really sad. I spent many years working at Ben Top during training where we would see five or six at night. Um, in children, you know, it's not as common, but when it happens, it's very, very sad. We see a couple of week now. And, um, and a lot of them were innocent bystanders or accidentally you know, found a gun and shot themselves or someone else. Um, it just devastates families and it's something that's preventable. And that's what, as someone who spent my life taking care of, you know, trying to save kids' lives, makes me very angry when you know, kids are dying from preventable things. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you touched um, uh, on, on some, something that's really um, important and that is gun violence and suicide. So Swati, I wanted to ask you, um, what, is, um, what is that relationship like between suicide and gun violence? And if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, um, we know there's a mental health crisis in this country and that people don't have access or don't access the care that they need. When you combine that lack of access to, uh, to healthcare, uh, with a firearm, the facts are really sobering. Every day, 64 Americans die by firearm suicide. That's one every 22 minutes. Nine out of 10 firearm suicide attempts result in death. It's very efficient. Firearm suicides account for 59% of AAPI deaths. Suicide rates among children who live in a home with a gun are four times higher than those who live in homes without guns. 40% of the suicides committed by children involve guns. Suicide is the leading cause of death among AAPI youth, ages 15 to 24. And as I've been talking and sharing and you know all of these numbers, you know, don't forget behind every number is a person, is a face. And for every person, there are multiple people associated with that person. And you can see like how prevalent, you know, gun violence actually is, the ripple effects of it, like Dr. Uh, Nayak was saying, Dr. Mathuria was saying. Um, it's just devastating. Um, 
So you, you talked about gun ownership. Um, what can people do to feel safe if there is a gun inside the house? Swati, if you could talk a little bit about that. So as we've been saying, um, more guns does not equate to safety. Research has shown that the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of a homicide against a woman by 500%. That's astronomical to me. Nine out of 10 youth suicides occurred using a gun that was found in their own home or a relative's home. And if you think you're immune from gun violence because you don't own a gun, you're wrong. 4.6 million children in the U.S live in a household with at least one loaded, unsecured firearm. And your kids might be visiting one of those homes. Purchasing a gun is not a decision to be made lightly. Every single consequence should be considered. And if you do own a gun, the single most important thing you can do is to lock that gun and store the ammunition separately. Hiding it on a shelf or putting it in a drawer is not the same thing. And you know, people might argue that they need a gun to be locked, I mean, they need a gun to be loaded and easily accessible in the event they feel you know, threatened. A, mood, a license, or sorry, a trained law enforcement officer it's a moving target three out of 10 times. And the three seconds that it takes you to unlock a gun and load it is three seconds more that you have to think about what you're about to do. If you have a family member experiencing a mental health crisis and you know there's a gun in the home, consider removing it. A lot of uh, police stations, um, will store your guns temporarily, just need to ask. And yes, you can and should talk about um, if your children see a gun, not to touch it and to report it to an adult. But remember, the onus of safety lies within the adult. It is our responsibility to ensure that a child does not have access to guns or firearms. And then talk, talk, Talk. We have got to start normalizing conversations around mental health and gun safety. Like, aside from all the political actions that we can take, today is about what we can do given the laws and given our status quo. So, like, what can we do now to keep ourselves safe? And these are some of the things you can do. Number one, make sure you lock your gun and store the ammunition separately. Thanks, Mr. Swaki. And uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, we have two tables in the back. Um, Every Town uh, is one of the sponsors of this event. They were gracious enough to help us put this event together and we've invited moms over here. They have a lot more information on exactly some of the things that Swaki was talking about. So please do visit them um, if you get a chance uh, before the evening is over. Um, so, Dr. Wynn, um, research suggests that certain demographic groups are disproportionately affected by gun violence. Um, can you talk a little bit about public health strategies that we can use in order to make sure that we have equity in preventing and responding to gun-related homicides? So, it's really unfortunate that there are folks who are surrounded by guns, they're easily accessible, they think that it's helpful to stay safe, and unfortunately it's, yeah, disproportionately people of color who are affected by these issues. Um, I think it's an important topic, as Fatih has talked about, to, to talk about it and normalize it with people, and let them know that this is a serious issue, and that, you know, just because you have this does not necessarily mean that you're safer. Um, I mean, I think some of the big measures to take are, you know, making sure that we try to keep guns away from people who are at risk of violence or have uh, are at high risk of um, men- are in a mental health crisis. I think that's really important. And normalizing conversations around mental health, especially within the Asian community, is really important to talk about. Um, I, I know my dad has like 
had a gun in the home at some point, and it makes me nervous to know that, but he's got a gun. Um, I think that's one of the big things, uh, making sure that people are trying to do things just to have, spreading the knowledge about safe storage, I think is important because I don't think people always realize that there are things like gun locks or storage, like gun storage containers that you can get into very quickly if you need to access it. And there are free gun locks back there. <laughs> there are free gun locks back there. So you know, those are some of the ways that you know, folks can talk about, normalize it. Um, I think asking other people if they have guns in the home, like if you are going to be going over to their home for a holiday or a dinner, um, it's a good idea to ask and just make sure that their guns are stored safely so that you can have a nice, enjoyable celebration. Um, there's, I think talking about it, normalizing it, sharing information, making sure you ask, uh, I think that's all really important so that everyone can be safe and protected as much as possible. Thank you. And um, uh, Dr. Mathuria, is there anything you can add to that? How can we um, craft our public health strategies to kind of get rid of some of these disparities? Yeah, absolutely. So in public health, um, the first thing you want to know is defining the problems, really knowing, understanding what's going on. So um, part of the research that we've done here in Harris County has shown that yes, um, minority, black, and Hispanic um, youth particularly are at higher highest risk for assault and homicide injuries, but that is not the case for the other types of shootings. So for example, for suicide, suicides are much more prevalent in white, not Hispanics, especially 55 and older, those that live in the suburbs. Okay, that's very different from the hotspots, the clusters of where the assaults and homicides are happening, which actually we're sitting in one right now, Sharpstown is one of them, Greens Point, um, you know, the ward area, there's several around the city that I think, you know, everyone knows of. But that's that's related to assault and homicide. There's different types of gun violence, right? So suicide, very different population. So identifying vulnerable populations is really important so you can target your resources appropriately. Um, when you look at kids, unintentional shootings or accidental shootings occur, occur across the board, all races, and in both urban and suburban neighborhoods. And so safe storage is really important, and it's not just a particular ethnic group, it should be everyone. Um, the, uh, the, our research has also shown that almost a third of um, youth um, injuries and shootings could have been prevented with safe storage. So that's obviously a, you know one that we can do, that's an easy one, but that's not gonna prevent the street shootings and things like that. A lot of that has to do with structural racism, with the neighborhoods being under-resourced, um, with there just being very, very little social support. Um, and so it's really multifaceted in that there needs to be um, support for mental health, but support for youth. Um, there needs to be, um, you know, give them something to do besides, uh, you know, uh, roaming around with other people that have guns. You know, it's, it's, it's and, and mostly resources, right? And a lot of these communities are really, really under-resourced, and um, that's where we can pour our resources. So that's the public health approach is, is looking at all of these things and figuring out where you can put your resources um, in the smartest way. Um, is there anything you wanted to add fluffy to that? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, um, and tying into what, you know, what both of you were saying, um, aside from safe storage in our homes, we need to take that that ideology everywhere we go. Again, normalizing the conversations, changing the culture, just like we did with seatbelts, right? I mean, um, if you have a gun, lock it. Um, and we need to take that to our, to the to the adults in schools and hospitals and gyms. I mean, like wherever adults are congregating, um, sign up with an organization that's actively working to advocate for gun safety like moms over there. And I will say that all of us here happen to be volunteers with moms. Um, and um, Be Smart, Be Smart, a, it's an acronym, but it's a great tool to kind of promote that culture of locking your guns. And then I think one of the most important things to this community, and it ties into what uh, Dr. Mabria was saying, is, when we talk about investment of resources, we need to stop looking at gun violence as something that affects other people. 
it affects all of us. There is not a single American issue that is not an AAPI issue, period. And we, we need to start standing in solidarity with those communities that are disproportionately affected because those are our, our, our friends, our coworkers, our children's friends, our children's teachers. We're not gonna solve this in a silo. We need, we need to build coalitions, work with other organizations that are you know, addressing gun violence, and we need to show up for those other communities that are continually you know, affected by, gun, by the scourge that is gun violence. And that's part of the investment of resources. It's us, it's the human capacity. Um, thank you so much, Swati. Um, we are actually running out of time. So I am going to, I did want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, so I have a little mic here. Is there any questions? Um, yeah. Uh. I have a quick question. So I understand this is really sad to see and talk about this kid and all, especially with the kids and stuff. So all these guns, they've been given to the teachers. Firearms going to be in the school. They're not given to teachers. So, They're not. If a teacher happens to have a gun and they want to use it, and the school district allows it. The district will allow. It. Correct. But the firearms are not being given to teachers. So are they going to keep it in school? Yes, they are in the school. Okay. So when we have mental issues going on all over what guarantee we have that teachers won't have that mental issues? <laughs> you know, and then those mental issues, teachers, they can use that firearms and can use being the kids. Because we are giving it to the school teachers without checking that, hey, if she has a problem or he has a problem. And nobody's looking at this thing. You know, they, they are trusting 100% of them, but how can we trust where our kids are going to their school? So anyone thought about this? So this event is an apolitical event. Um, we are not going to discuss legislation. That's yeah, a complete... Okay. I can raise the question. Yes, that, <laughs> he could, but not in this forum. Not in this forum. Um, it is, this is about what do we do with our status quo, the existing gun laws that we do have. And, um, and it is disconcerting. So that is where we, as community members, as parents, we, we need to step up, we need to support schools more, um, we need to advocate at our school boards. School boards have a lot of um, jurisdiction, they've got a lot of leeway in terms of what they will and will not allow. Talk to your school boards. Tell them that this doesn't sit well with you, um, and 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 have those conversations with them. Um, but in terms of what legislation looks like, that's a whole different conversation. The teacher is always in stress. It's true. Yes, it's true. It, it is. It's true. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, did you have a question? Hello, my name is Yen Rambe, and I'm an educator. Uh, but I'm talking today, I have a comment, really, not a question. And I just want to share that my neighbor, they had a grandson that just passed away because of gun violence. And they're trying to process whether it's suicide or homicide. And Coming here, I see that that would have not have to happen if there was not a gun present in the house. So I appreciate this um, this event tonight. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, while that person's getting the microphone, I'll just throw into that. You know, we're still trying to learn about the best practices and best policies that can help keep everybody safe. I want to point out that for about 25 years or so, the CDC did not have funding to do, to study about gun violence and ways to effectively prevent it. And it wasn't until the past couple of years under the current presidential administration that they 
released, they've actually dedicated money to study this question and that Dr. Mindy here is one of the lucky recipients of some of that grant money. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have more, we'll have better responses about evidence-based because Because right now we don't have evidence that arming teachers isn't effective. We don't, we don't know. It could be, it might be. But we also know that more guns don't necessarily increase our, our, our sense safety. of safety. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, but unfortunately, guns aren't going anywhere. <laughs> so it's just like, I mean, I, I just like to think of it as cars. Everyone has a car. Cars are dangerous. You could drive a car into here right now and kill a bunch of people. It's the exact same thing. So we have to live with them. We just have to figure out the safe way to live with them. And that people who drive cars, for example, um, if you're old, if you're uh, too old and too blind and um, have a stroke, you're not allowed to drive a car. So it's it's the same it's the same concept. You have to wear a seatbelt to um, have, you know ride a car. And then the other thing is. When car accidents happen, law enforcement, everyone has to report them. Right now, no one's reporting um, firearm injuries, so it's hard to track them. <coughs> and so those are all ways that eventually um, made highway safer, made cars safer, made people safer. And so hopefully in another 20 years, it'll be the same thing with the guns that we're working with. Well, and also like stolen firearms, right? I mean, again, not locking a firearm results in increased theft, and then, you know, they're in the hands of, you know, people who shouldn't have one. Hello, um, thanks again for putting on this panel. Um, my name is Karthik Sura, I'm a former HISD teacher, and I still vividly remember um, getting a potential alert as a chemistry teacher, having to huddle on the ground in the lab with my students, uh, because we thought there was a potential mass shooter uh, coming to the school. And um, we had to reassure them, but like, you know, I was just like, oh, a chemistry teacher, there's like acid, you'll be safe, but it was all it was a lot, right? Like, that kind of stuff is not helpful um, in any way. And so that was around the time of Newtown at which like nothing ne necessarily happened. And so given Ovalde and Allen, a lot, of, a lot of times I feel despair in Texas. And I think a lot of us feel very despair, the despairing in Texas. So I wanna flip the question on its head. What do you all see around the nation and other countries as well as different states that gives you hope about making progress on gun violence? Yeah, so I think it's young people. I think young people are gonna change a narrative like our congressman said here. Um, truly gonna change a narrative, we're gonna vote um, for gun safety policies and um, you know, have grown up living with this fear. And that's, you, you can just see that wave coming. And I really think that that's gonna change, change things. You know, I, I know that this, was, this is not about policy and legislation, but there is a, there is a shift happening. Illinois on Friday, um, their state Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of banning assault rifles in their state. Um, they also signed into law um, being able to hold accountable any bad actors targeting um, children uh, with inappropriate firearm ads. Um, so there, there, are, there is change happening um, as we often say, it's, um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, we just, um, we have to do what we can do to keep ourselves safe as a community. You were talking about mass gun violence. As awful as mass gun violence is, it's only, I think like 2%, 1% of all the gun deaths. Every day, 110 people die from gun violence and another 200 are shot and injured. That's, that is every single day. That is what we need to be addressing. Thank you so much for, uh, to our panel. If you can give them a, a round of applause. Uh, for our next panel, I'm gonna invite uh, Rish Oberoi. He is the executive director of Indian American uh, chapter here in Texas. And he'll be um, talking to some of our local political leaders about what we can do about the gun violence issues. Thank you, Nabila. And everyone, please give a round of applause to Nabila for putting this together. I can have our panelists join. Uh, we have Representative Jean Wu, uh, Representative Ann Johnson, and Assistant Chief
And uh, Dr. Representative Alani was supposed to join us, but unfortunately he got caught up in DC. Uh, so unfortunately he will not be with us today. Everyone hear me in the back all right? Yes. And folks, my name is Rich Obroy. I'm the State Director for Indian American Impact. So again, I wanna thank you all for coming out here. So our, um, you know, all these questions will be directed to everyone, but you know, some are more legislative specific. Some would love to hear from a law enforcement angle. So starting off, um, this is, again, largely directed at our state representatives here. Um, what legislation have we seen in recent years at the state, local, or federal level uh, to combat gun violence? And uh, everyone's got a mic, right? Very good. Is it? Great. Uh, my name's Ann Johnson. I proudly represent House District 134, which is just to the east of this area in Meyerland, Bel Air, up to Timber Grove, the Medical Center, and River Oaks. This was my second session, and I am proud to tell you that we actually got House Bill 165 passed and signed into law. And it was a challenge that we started in the 87th session with the support of Moms Demand Action, and we addressed an issue of mass shooters and created a definition of mass shooters in Texas and created a criminal penalty of a first degree felony. It passed the House, it died in the Senate. And I heard some folks in the Senate say, we don't really need that law. Well, about two weeks later, somebody went on 6th Street and shot 13 people. And that would have been tried as a second degree felony as just aggravated assault non stackable And then a few months later, three police officers in Houston were shot when a man carjacked an individual, was trying to get away from a warrant, had an assault weapon, and shot three police officers. Fortunately, nobody died. But because of the existing law, that case will have to be prosecuted like one bullet was fired at one officer and it is a non-stackable offense. I am glad to tell you that with the support of law enforcement and changing the dialogue from the session before where every anti-gun legislation group came up with their guns on their hips and they opposed it and said, we oppose it. We didn't change our definition to make people happy. We said, no, nope, we're gonna come back again and we're gonna try to pass the mass shooter legislation. And this time in presenting the bill, a number of Republicans said, hey, I watched those videos of those officers being shot and I need to get behind this. We also had the families from Uvalde. We had Moms Demand Action that continually were coming to the Capitol and advocating that it is time for us to no longer be held hostage by people that say gun legislation cannot pass in Texas. Now this is a small step, but it's the same way that people realize, hey, this makes common sense and I need to do it. We equally need to pass background checks, extreme risk protection orders, safe storage, and by God, we need to raise the age to 21 on assault weapons. So I am glad that we took one step, small step. We took it because of your engagement, and I'm gonna tell you that we need your activism to keep the ball rolling for common sense gun safety legislation in the state of Texas. I got you, I'll pull it. You good? Uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Gene Lou, I'm gonna say rep for, I guess, this area. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm really grateful for Ann for, for working on the legislation, and at least some legislation that passed, like very, I, I think this is actually about, I think the only one that passed. Um, so I, I'm gonna try, and I heard this comments earlier, I'm gonna try to keep this as nonpartisan as possible, but I have my limits. Um, <laughs> but here's, Here's the basic thing, and I know, um, and I know we, we we do a lot of discussions about mass shootings and stuff because because mass shootings are of course what gets everyone's attention. It's what ends up on cable news for like a week at a time. But you know, like, and I've had this conversation with a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues who represent urban areas. We don't have mass shoot a lot of mass shootings in in the inner city, right? We have a lot of individual shootings, one at a time, one bullet one victim at a time. And sort of like my comment is, those, whether you kill 21 at a time, or you kill one at a time, 
those are just as bad. They're just as egregious. You're still taking someone's life, and you're using guns that were that were very, very often attained illegally. And we have made zero efforts. I'm well, not zero efforts. We have made zero strides in helping curb that kind of violence. Um, you know. Um, and just talked about the 21 for 21, raising the age of purchase. But another important thing for, for, for the communities around here, another important thing is universal background searches, right? And that's saying every single gun transfer or purchase must be accompanied by a background check. I don't care if you're selling it at a gun show, I don't care if you're selling it at a gun store, I don't care if it's one neighbor selling it to another neighbor. We wanna know who sold it, who purchased it, and whether the person purchasing it has a legal right to have a firearm. And here's the reason why. Um, you know, both Anna and I, we, um, we represent um, criminal cases, right? And I, she represents adults, I represent kids. And over and over again, we have these uh, have cases where it's like a 14 year old doing a stick up with a real gun. Never once has Anyone in the process asked, where did this gun come from? And you know why? Because it doesn't matter. Because what are you gonna do? Are you gonna prosecute them? There's no law that says that it's illegal to sell it to a 14 year old or anything like that. There's no effort to track down who transferred this gun over. If we had a universal background trip check, that said you were required to check before you transfer. It is every owner's obligation to do that. Then there are now penalties if you don't, right? So all a gun violence around here, when they catch them, when they catch them with the weapons, we would be able to say, as a part of the additional investigation, not only will we prosecute you for the crime itself, but we're gonna find out who sold you a gun because you are a convicted felon and you should have never had a gun in the first place. And the person who gave you that gun, who gave you the tools to commit that crime, we want them to, right? And that's not gonna happen until we pass universal background checks. And the over and over again, we hear people talking about, oh, the laws don't work, criminals don't, don't fall off. Criminals don't follow laws every single day. We still prosecute their asses, right? We still throw them in jail, right? And then, you know, and, uh, and this is my, my, my biggest thing, is like, you know, if you look at the um, Uvalde you you shooting situation, and you look at what happened, and you read the report, it said the Uvalde shooter tried multiple times, half a dozen times before he turned 18 to get someone else to buy it, to try to buy it from a store and see if they'll fudge the rules, to try to get someone else to transfer it to him, any, word, any number of ways. And everybody along the line says, uh uh, we ain't doing that. That's against the law. I'm not going to prison for you. Laws work. They may not work 100% of the time, but they work more often than not. Oh. Uh, so this question is directed at Assistant Chief Bashir. Uh, so you know, I would love to. We would love to hear from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, what what can be done better? Uh, what's preventable? Just you know, in terms of average everyday citizens, what do you see from your experience? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, let me go ahead and uh, give a quick introduction. My name is Yasser Bashir, I'm Assistant Chief for what's called the Tourism Three. So I have the entire Southwest part of Houston, and also I'm over at Metro Health Division. And I formerly used to work at our family violence division, so I have a better understanding of what gun violence causes in, um, in a family family violence incident. So I have a lot of passion for that. And I'm just wanna say thank you. I'm truly honored to be here. First, let me just thank a few people. I have uh, Lieutenant Louie. He's from our West Side DRT. He does an excellent job doing community outreach, educating our citizens about different, uh, different uh, issues that's happening in the community especially and how to prevent, uh, take preventive measures to protect oneself. And also have 
Officer Fan and Gallegos, uh, they are patrol officers. Whenever we have a gun violence incident, guess who, who's the first one to respond? Our patrol officers. And they're the ones who are making some difficult decisions about how to save that person's life, including tourniquets. We never used to carry tourniquets 20 years ago, but now every officer has a tourniquet. Um, I also have Officer Tran and Officer Hamid, they're the community liaison officers, who have community affairs uh, division. And they're out, they're out there working every day, building trust, and also attending these kind of community events where they can educate our community as well. And I also want to thank our public officials, our council members, and especially our nurses and doctors. If it wasn't for them, we probably would have a way higher homicide in this city if it, if it wasn't for them providing the best medical to save those lives. That's what I said, thank you. Um, and also want to thank our mayor because of the one state use of crime reduction initiative that we are doing, we have made some significant impact in making this city safer. So the main topic today is about what? Prevention and what are we seeing? Over my years, I'm sure the patrol officers and everybody here, we have seen a lot of homicides, family violence incidents, loved one died, road rage incidents. But some things I truly believe are preventable. We have legislation, but there are some things we can prevent on our own, and that's something I'm just gonna talk about today. To make sure you guys get the point that I'm not just speaking here, let me, let me get that real quick. I also, we also brought some gun safes. We talked about gun safes, so here's some one I'm gonna give somebody here today for as long as you get that question right. <laughs> or close to it as possible, okay? Now here's the things we can definitely prevent. Last week, about two weeks ago, we had a three-year-old shoot himself. How is that even possible? How does a three-year-old have an access to a weapon? That's preventable. We have many children lose their lives because they're taking a gun and pointing at each other and pulling the trigger. That's preventable. But gun security is definitely something we all can do. The second thing I want to talk about is something we see is, like, like you mentioned, Good citizens leaving their weapon, not being responsible in the vehicle, and those guns are stolen in BMVs and auto thefts. Those are avoidable. They should be zero. So I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna ask you a quick question, and whoever gets it right, I'll give you a quick, I gotta give you a safe. <laughs> All right. If you decide you have to leave your gun in the car, this safe will protect you. From it, okay. So how many guns were stolen last year, 2022, in in vehicles? How many guns? Take a guess. Yes. 23,000. 23,000. I hope not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. that high. <laughs> Lower. How about that? Yes, sir. Uh, 700. All right. How about this? Price is right. That's higher. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it higher. Was it? 2,000. 2,000? All right. Price is higher. 5 percent. Lower. All right. Don't, don't say one dollar, okay? <laughs> all right, that's close enough, otherwise we'll be here all day, okay? All right, actually not close enough, but it's close enough for me. All right, 4,400, 4,401. And you get a free save. All right. I know it's only one, we have four more we're gonna give away, but if you're not the lucky one, please write this down real quickly. September 26th, I'm sorry, September 21st, 6.30 p.m. at our West Side Police Station, which is on South, which is on South Derry Ashford, between Richmond and uh, West Park. On this date, we will be giving away more gun safes. It's free, so please come on that day and we'll give you one. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about is training. Over the years, yes, we had school shootings. Yes, we had many different incidents. As a professional law enforcement, we are better trained to respond to active shooter incidents than we were before. All our officers in HPD are trained. And now the, the new legislation, everybody in the state of Texas have to get that training. It doesn't matter small department or big department, you have to get that training. The other thing I want to talk about is AAPI, the one of the violence that 
I want, it's not about guns, but sometimes a gun is introduced in this type of crime. It's juggings. Every time I get a, you know, on a town hall meeting, I always mention this. Please, please don't carry large bread, large amount of cash with you because there are criminals out there who are watching you and they're targeting you. Every day, our officers are out there proactively looking for these individuals and getting them, uh, you know, getting them, uh, you know, apprehending them. Just today, we had an incident. If you watch the news, where this one citizen went to a bank and uh, the person followed him and they end up in a shooting. So make sure that you take preventive measures if you are carrying a large amount of cash. And I can go on and on, but the main thing I want to talk about was you know, gun prevention, not only guns are legal, don't have only gun laying around the house. Um, and, uh, and you know, just anything else I'll be more than happy to answer. And then we have four more gun safe we want to give away by the end of the day, the end of the night. Thank you so much for the great answer. And uh, this next question actually, Representative Johnson kind of touched on it, but in terms of engagement. Um, so and again, this applies to all of our panelists, but you know, how, how can regular citizens get involved on the, uh, on the legislative side, on the advocacy side of, of, of combating gun violence? Uh, what can we hope for from the various levels of government, state, local, federal, what do you recommend? Show up. So just as you're doing here tonight, um, show up when we are in Austin and have an opportunity to file this legislation. So when we are in Austin every odd year from January until May, Representative Wu and I can file whatever we want. And we can file that legislation, hopefully it gets to committee, maybe it gets to the floor. If we're lucky, we can get it a hearing. And it's at that point that we need you to show up for a hearing. So let me tell you who always shows up. Groups like Gun Owners of America, the GOA. And let me tell you, they make the NRA look very soft. These folks walk around with shirts that say compromise and death. They wear guns on their hip. And they purposely will come to any committee hearing where we're having any discussion about gun issues, including criminal penalties to hold people uh, accountable. And if you're doing anything that addresses an issue of a gun, they will stand up against it and say no. And what they're doing is they are giving a dog whistle politically to certain people to say, if you vote on this or move this, we will have a response. And so that's why we need an equal balance. Those red shirts back there that say moms demand action and those folks that show up this year, the Uvalde family, they were there the entire session. Those family members, those parents, they came to see us. They brought us the cards from their children's funerals and they worked this session. And when we got to a point where their legislation was not gonna get a vote, they brought more people with them. They stood in the hall and they chanted. And they got the pressure to such a point that there was a stop in the process to have the committee go back and vote. Now the timing was so late that we couldn't get it to the floor but it was that kind of public pressure from the parents of dead children. And I will tell you that I've had people talk to me about events that will bring people to the polls. And I thought Sandy Hook would be the thing that would say that a political division around an irrational discussion on guns, I got news for you, I don't want your guns. I wanna know that legally you can own one, that you're a good citizen, that these officers have not arrested for violent crime. I wanna know that you're in a good mental position, that you're not gonna hurt yourself or somebody else. And I wanna know that you're not gonna put it around a toddler. Just in the same thing that I wanna know that you're 16 to drive a car and any other regulation that we have on many things for community safety. And so we need all of you that recognize gun violence is the greatest uh, killer of children, yep. that those bodies matter. And that the fact that that's not the main piece of legislation we're going to Austin to solve, and it's a hard discussion for a long day that can't get there, that our priorities are messed up. And so I appreciate what you have done. I appreciate your support, but it really is, like I'm proud to be a gun sense um, elected official. And that means that the folks that know have vetted me and will say, look for these candidates. There are a couple of Republicans that took a hard vote in a committee to pass the Raise the Age to 21. I, I, 
support them for that vote. I don't agree with them on a lot of other stuff, but I completely support and appreciate that they took that vote. And it has to be a vote they are now afraid of you and no longer just afraid of a couple of beholden political groups. I don't have anything to add to that. And <laughs> uh, my only, okay, I'll add one thing, vote. Until there are political consequences for this. And, and I'll say this, what, I know the 21 for 21, the bill did not pass. But in Texas, for that bill to even be given a hearing, much less voted out of committee, was a big deal. Like I know it doesn't feel like a lot, but in Texas for that bill to come out of committee was a big deal. And it tells us one thing, your voices matter, right? Your voices matter, public pressure matters, your votes matter. You, you cannot say I care about these things, but then take no action. We gotta, this is on our community to fight. And our, we fight with our words, we fight with our votes. And let me just also say, and I know y'all know this, the simple act of raising the age to 21 to buy an assault weapon just brings us right where we are with handguns. Not only that, but it is oftentimes those kids that are 18 or 19 that have challenges that go back to the school they just graduated from. Mm -hmm. And so raising the age to 21 would make a significant reduction. Doing to 25 would be even more, but raising the age to 21 would significantly reduce mass shootings something that literally has become commonplace in our state. And at some point we have to tell people, the leaders that we keep sending to those positions that decide what we talk about in special session and other places, if they won't address this issue, then change the people who are in a leadership position. Wonderful answer. Um, Chief Pichu, do you have anything to add in terms of citizen, citizen engagement? Um, no, I don't have anything to add. I mean, I can only speak from my experience as law enforcement officers, as what we see every day, and what, you know, the trauma that we experience, all this gun violence, and how we're responding to it. Uh, the one thing I do want to add is, as far as gun prevention, we also have a shot spotter or gun detection system in our most problematic small geographical area where we have deployed this, and whenever there's a discharge of firearm, we respond to that location both one, because we know that a firearm will discharge. Um, many times, actually, before we even get 911 calls, we would be a ride. There were many incidents that we actually we found a victim who was shot and were able to save, uh, save, save, save their lives. So that's one thing aspect we're doing. The other thing I wanna mention is sometimes, you know, during the certain, certain days of the year, you may have to start people shooting in the air. Do not hesitate to call and contact us. Mm -hmm. An officer will arrive, we will look for any type of evidence, and if there's any shell casing on the ground, we will tag it. So if you find any, let us know, we'll tag it, and then we'll do is later on we'll process that, and then that evidence could be linked with other discharged firearms, and then we can build better cases. Don't think that when it comes to guns, any type of evidence is not, you know, doesn't have any value to you. So we have actually solved many cases where this weapon was used in an ag robbery and then road rape incident, and we, you know, we were able to capture the guy, the suspect with that gun, and all these cases were linked. They were able to put more charges on them, and then they actually ended up getting federal charges. So that's one thing I would tell you is please, if you, you see something, report the crime, and let us investigate. Don't think anything is, uh, you know, this it will not get solved. Sometimes maybe not not at that time, but in the future we're able to link cases. That's something I would like to add to, uh, to this. Folks, thank you so much. Give a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> yeah, we do have time for, uh, for a few questions, so I'd love to open it up to the, all right, folks are ready to go. Thank you, Camila. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Afran, and I'm a Uh My question is, is there, uh, like, Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Representative Jen and uh, Dr. Sulaiman Lalani, you guys present the world of education also. Uh, is there any way, like the most mass shooting taking place in schools? And uh, is there any way we can educate these uh, parents and uh, you know, in the higher schools and the colleges 
I mean, we have, I mean, these mass shootings, all these taking places over there, and these are the kids who are morally into getting the criminals and uh, using the guns and everything. So how come we have never thought about uh, bringing these educations into the higher schools and the colleges and universities where we can educate those kids and, uh, you know, but at the right level, at the age, where they're ready to understand how we can stop the crime and, uh, again, same thing, we can make it mandatory as a universal law, like you mentioned about the car insurance or the car driving license, right? You have to have register your car. I think uh, that was my question, like, why we never, thank you. So, so we actually do, uh, the, a lot of the schools actually do gun violence prevention stuff, but it's on a very, like, high-level basis. Um, the kids who are young, young people who are um, committing mass shootings, who are going to be future gang members and, and uh, other types of criminals, they need very specific and directed types of intervention, right? Just a, um, just a class about it is not going to change anything. Um, we've not done a lot in that front, but we're trying to do more. Um, uh, for example, one of the big things I worked on this last leather session that I spent a lot of time on was I, I, I snuck in about like a $50 million rider into the budget to uh, provide direct mental health counseling and support for students in uh, students at school who are raising red flags, right? So if you read the, the Uvalde report on the shooter, like you read through it and it's like person after person said, this kid exhibited red flag after red flag after red flag. And you know what? And as someone who represents kids in the criminal justice system, those are the same red flags I see in the kids that I represent on, 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 on the murder charges, or on robbery charges, or whatever else. And I said, like, why didn't we do anything? Even though so many people saw these red flags, the answer is, with what resource? What money, right? And now we're trying to put in some money to say, like, look, if, you're, if the school administrators, if the teachers, principals are spotting these red flags, whether it's gonna be a potential mass shooter, whether it's gonna be potential like a, a criminal gang member, whatever it is, let's try to intervene. Let's try to do something. And these are gonna be more direct intervention and we're hoping it makes a difference. I, just wanna add I, think I, I just wanna quickly add, um, many of the shootings, uh, most of the time they're over before the law enforcement get there, yeah. okay? So that's something I want you guys to be aware of. So this is where, as a community, can, what can we do to mitigate, have a better understanding of what happens, what role you can play, save your life and save somebody else's life as well. So we do have subject matter experts. If you ever need anybody to come and teach you at your community center, or any type of event, we'd be more than happy to coordinate and get those officers to talk about this, about active shooter incidents, what happens, and what role you know, each person can do to save, save his or her life. So please, if you have any questions, we, you know, we can, uh, we don't answer your question after, how to get that, how to make that happen. Thank you. So, uh, so my name is Dr. Helen Shu. I'm one of the board members for, uh, for Rise API and uh, help organizing this event. So uh, one of the reasons why we're having this discussion here is because of this uh, robbery case that happened right here, uh, not too far away from here. And uh, I later on learned from the police officer who came to our meeting that he said that this person who was robbed, robbed, he was actually carrying a gun. And while he was trying to reach out his gun, the person actually shot him quite a few times. So the question was in our community, it's it about, okay, what happened if this person did not carry a gun? Would that be, you know, the scenario would be different. In other words, the question is, if people carry guns, would that make them safe or not? And we especially want to hear from the police point of view, because when you come to the scene and when their crime happened, right, if people really carry gun, would that make the situation more dangerous? And the reason I ask this question is because there was uh, discussions and talk about people buying more guns, and, you know, they should uh, come to Chinatown with more guns, and would that make our community safer? And that's a really critical topic that people need to hear from, you know, police experience on that. Thank you for that too. That's a very good question, but I'm unfortunately I don't have an answer for that. Because it's a circular argument. You can say yes, if you have a gun, you can defend yourself. In this incident, the person did have a gun, but unfortunately still was shot multiple times. Today, as I mentioned earlier, we had one incident where actually the person 
you know, he shot the, uh, the suspects. Um, so it, it all depends on you as an individual, how you feel, how confident you are in holding that weapon. Just because you have a weapon does not make you proficient. Okay, so you have to be trained, you have to practice, and you have, how quickly you have access to it. And uh, those things, when things happen, they happen very fast. Uh, sometimes even people have weapons, they just give up because they know they can't reach for the weapon. It could just make things worse. Sometimes they're just better trained and mentally ready for any type of situation that, that may happen. Ideally, if I could, we could, we would love to have a police officer at every intersection. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So we have to take preventive measures, how we can protect ourselves, be aware of our surroundings. Um, I mean, there were times like, you know, just recently, about a month ago, I mean, I was, I was in my uniform, I was off duty, I was going home, just near 59 and Beltway 8. I see a car just leaving and just stopped right on the bed. So I was like, mentally I was ready. I said, well, if this guy gets out of the car, I'm mentally prepared. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. The point I'm trying to make is you have to mentally prepare for whatever you're ready for. If you're not ready for it, the gun is not gonna do you any good. And you have to practice with it. The accuracy, like you mentioned, three out of 10 officers. Three out of 10 times. 10 times. At least that's a good, good, uh, a good number. But anyway, so that's why the accuracy. So, like I said, it's hard for me to answer that question. It all depends on the individual, how, how secure and safe you feel as well. Uh, so, yeah, I will end I'll, I'll at that. I will say, you know, I think it's discouraging this idea in Texas where we passed last year what they call constitutional carry, that everybody has the right to carry a gun regardless, um, in fact, they wanted to intervene with law enforcement's ability to, to um, investigate in those cases. But the idea that we're going to turn to the wild, wild west, and one of the things that bothers me is we've even seen elected officials within the last few days that have been busted screaming at police officers. And this idea that police officers shouldn't have the support of our community to do the job they do. We're talking about gun violence right now. I've been with the DA's office, Rep. Wu's been with the DA's office, Sean Tier's been with the DA's office, and we can tell you that we see on a daily basis. While we fear gun violence, every morning they put on this shirt and they walk out knowing that they are a target of it. And anytime they pull somebody over, that person can have an AR-15 that can fire at them at will. So these are the folks that on a daily basis go out, they are trained, they are competent, and they are there to protect us. And the idea that we need to create this false rhetoric that somehow all of us need to be walking around with a gun on our hip because these individuals can't do their job is irrational and illogical. I will also say, I saw a guy in a restaurant the other day wearing a big old shirt and he had an American flag gun on his hip. And it was very provocative and showy. And I thought about my investigator, who I know was packing a couple of guns, but I don't know where he had them. Because that's the dumbest thing to do in the world is to wear a gun on your hip because if there is somebody coming in to commit a crime, you're the first target. And so whatever this comical analysis that's been put out there, that somehow that we each need to engage in a gunfight. I also think about those videos of people in restaurants where the kid comes in with a gun, guy jumps up, shoots him dead, kicks the gun away, looks at it, realizes it's a BB gun and throws it against the wall. And just think about that guy and how he will live with the rest of his life knowing that he killed a kid with a plastic gun for a few bucks that somebody got off the table. Now they shouldn't commit that robbery, but we also shouldn't turn our society and our law enforcement on the head to think that those of us that are untrained need to do the job that we have asked them to do on a daily basis and put themselves in danger, of which they make that sacrifice. So we thank you as well, not only for what you do, um, but want to highlight what you stand for and how important you are to our community and our society. Thank you. The only thing I'll add is jumping on um, Johnson's point is, um, you know, for every time you hear a story that somebody success successfully defended themselves with their own firearm, there are like a dozen stories where somebody, they got shot by their own kid, they sh the kid shot themselves, the kid shot a friend, or they mishandled their weapon and shot themselves, right? We never, we don't really pay attention to those stories, but they're out there, they're out there 
all the time. And this is, and I, I support people, and I'm the same way, I, I support people carrying their guns if you are trained to carry those guns and you have done, you've taken the education, you've taken the practice, and you actually know what you're doing. Because an untrained firearm owner is probably more dangerous to the rest of us than if they weren't armed, right? Um, and, and this is, and part of the problem is the constitutional carry bill is it deleted the requirement that people get licensed. It deleted the requirement that people get education. It deleted the requirement that people get training. And that's what really makes a difference. If people want to carry guns, go for it. Well, number one, conceal it. Don't wear it on your hip like an idiot, right? But, but the most important part is you have to be trained. Officers who carry guns get constant training. It's not like you go to go to a police academy, you get trained one time and that's it. They're, they have constant training. And if you are a good gun owner and you want to carry a gun, you have to do the same thing. That's it. And Gene, just to highlight that, while you guys were up here right now, Harris County Sheriff's deputy was just shot and life away. And the suspect is on the loose. So that's a patrol deputy that's had yep. years of training. And, and uh, I was saying, like, just on the note of uh, uh, Chief Bashir talked about this as well, about the number of guns that are stolen right, because of irresponsible gun owners leaving them in the car, leaving them on the table, forgetting them in the bathroom, whatever it is. There is only one place you're going to sell a stolen gun. You know who that's going to be? Criminals. Right? There's only one person, one type of person that's going to buy a stolen gun. And so every time there is an irresponsible gun owner out there who's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it is endangering our community. Folks, thank you so much. Round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> That's the end of our uh, panel session. I'm hand over to Mila for some closing remarks. All right, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, as we close out, uh, we did want you to come and take a look at some of the tables back there and we want to thank um, our sponsor, Every Town for Gun Safety, as well as our other co-sponsors, Indian American Impact, Engage Action, DIA, Emerging Voters, UCA, and TMAC. So thank you so much. Stay tuned. We will have more programs about this and we hope you have a good rest of the week. <coughs>